steam generator cars. These will be transitional time cars, 50s into the 60s. And they had multiple uses of which you may not have even thought of. The purpose of the steam generator car was the railroads needed something for steam when they got rid of their steam locomotives and still did not have an excess supply of passenger units or Jeep sevens or nines with boilers. And so they needed something, uh, also a wrecker, pile drivers, uh, that type of thing, industries whose boilers broke down. They used to supply steam engines. They didn't have them anymore. Steam, uh, water tanks are gone, coal is gone. And so many, many railroads came up with what they called the steam generator car, heater car, uh, otherwise. And I, what I want to start out with here is the multiple uses of this car and why I think each of you should have one of these on your layouts because it is a cool car to have in your car cards and move around on your layout. This first picture is taken out of Omaha on a Chamber of Commerce special. And you'll notice it's pulled by two Fairbanks Morris H1666s that are freight units. No boilers on these units. And so they hook up a steam generator car to supply steam to those coaches. So you can run passenger with freight locomotives. That's uh, a cool thing to be able to do. The Northwestern built their first one in June of 1952 when they scrapped their first Class H Northerns, number 50, uh, 3017. And when they cut that locomotive up, they rolled this tender into the 40th Street shops and converted it into a multi-purpose car. Now there's a difference between multi-purpose and steam generator. And we will get into that as we go through it. This is a photograph Take it at Waukegan on a commuter train, the Alco freight locomotive, RSD4, was at the head end of these cars, and the steam generator was hooked onto the rear. Now, you may wonder, at the head of, this, of these cars, the steam would be coming out of the Barco steam pipe on the last car. It didn't have connections to go through the diesel. So these were used on the rear of some trains. Now here's a picture of the same area. The RSD4 has been put back on the front. It's a freight unit. The car is brand new. It's under test. And they're getting ready to pull this commuter train from Waukegan back to Chicago. And what you're seeing at the bottom uh, of the uh, photograph here is a 25 kW Waukesha engine generator set. And we'll get into details of that. It was hung uh, underneath uh, the car body. Another one of the uses of this. This was used in Sioux City, and several of you will remember the huge flood that Sioux City had that wiped out almost all of the meat industry and killed thousands of head of cattle. This was the rendering works plant, which couldn't keep up with rendering Don't you worry about that. We are those dead that cattle. So they got a hold of the railroad. The railroad, instead of sending out a steam engine to hook up to their, to their boiler to go 24-7 in the operation, 
they set out the steam generator car. So any industry on your layout that has got boiler problems or needs a boiler replacement, you can use a steam generator car or call a heater car or whatever the railroads named them. And this is a cool deal because if you're running with car cars, you just slip a piece of paper in there that says, hey, the next, the next train to uh, out of Bell Plain, you go over to the roundhouse and get this heater car or steam generator car and take it to such and such a town and set it out for an industry. So it's, it adds to uh, the operating of the layout. Now, if this picture was taken probably maybe two years sooner, instead of the steam generator car behind that pile driver, you would add an old locomotive tender with coal and water and probably a 10 wheeler hooked up to that to propel this. The generator is not self propelled and neither is the, the pile driver. But in this case, this pile driver is so old that the railroad did not want to spend the money to dieselize it. It was later replaced with an American crane that was dieselized and self propelled. This pile driver at the moment is at the museum at Union. So here we have uh, an FM and the steam generator car. Another slightly different shot, and I purposely ran this one. This steam generator car is equipped with the Waukesha 25 kW <laughs> generator, which supplies electrical power, can be used with electrical drills in drilling holes through vents and for the inserting of bolts and so forth. It has a very large air compressor. So if any ties up in this area need to be tamped, it can be done. So it's a multiple purpose. The Northwesterns was a multiple purpose car. Here is another use of it at the Marshalltown Northwestern shops. The boiler is down. And as you can see, we have steam down here towards the bottom and a little bit at the top. This car is hot. It's hooked up to the boiler and supplying steam for the shops at the moment. And for those of you that may be a little bit unfamiliar, we got a pair of Jeep 30s here with a uh, F3 slug, which was very popular on the cowboy line. You'd see, Doug, the roundhouse is even still standing in this shot. So this would be early, this would be late 50s, I guess. Now here is a top layout of the Northwestern car and I inserted it here rather than later because I want you to see how much stuff the Northwestern had in their, in their tender. They put a wall across about in the center of the car and this tender was 18,000 gallons of water and 20 tons of coal. So this petition backed that water down to 11,000 gallons and gave them the front area where the coal bin uh, was to mount the equipment. There's two fuel tanks, one mounted in each corner. There is a standard uh, vapor Clarkson boiler, which was probably identical to the very largest that they had at the time in the, e, in the E8s. And that boiler was putting out uh, 
3,500 uh, pounds of steam per hour at 200 PSI. Well, a pile driver used more steam than that. So they put accumulator tanks on the roof to fill while that pile driver was in motion to drive the next pile and pick it up and get it into place this whole system then would be fully charged. There is an air compressor in here. There is another uh, small generator, which was used for the coach lights, which were 24 volt DC, while the other electrical equipment uh, that you would use outside the car like drills and so forth, would have been the standard, probably 240 volt AC. Had uh, sliding doors, had a door on the, fr uh, the, uh, the coal end, another sliding door here, and all of the circuit breakers and transformers and everything required to run all this equipment, the coil washing solution tank for the boiler, the AU passenger air brake system was up on top of the tender. Uh, the 25 kW Waukesha mounted underneath took up the room. So you can see this was probably what you would call the Cadillac of steam generator cars. Now I'm gonna run through a series of cars from ugly to too large to operate on a layout. So somewhere in this list, you're gonna be able to find a car a tender, a box car, a troop sleeper that will fit the needs of your layout. This one on the uh, DNH called a mobile heating unit has a steam boiler in this area. And I could not tell or find out if which tank here was water and which was fuel. I assume that there may be other equipment housed here, but you'll notice there's no outlets on this car. So there's no air or electrical outlets to connect. It was strictly a heating unit. And my guess is painted in the colors and the car that it was made from could have been a converted 40 foot flat or a box car uh, would be maintenance of way only. Here's another ugly duckling on the Portland terminal in which it looks, appears to be built onto the frame of a Bosch car. It's got the old Andrew trucks, looks like a chunk of a tender and the rest of it is just a bunch of sheet metal. Again, no fittings. <coughs> Here is the air intake and the exhaust to the boiler. <coughs> So this would be maintenance of way heater car. And this would be not used in passenger service. Now the Santa Fe built several heater cars <coughs> from their locomotive tenders. And what they did, they raised the water deck uh, on the old steam tender and went up to where the coal bunker was and enclosed the whole thing, made this in the water tank. We've got a boiler or a exhaust air intake. This was probably done in the Cleburne, Texas shops. Looks like <coughs> we've got EMD portholes. Uh, access on both sides, but no access on the ends. Diesel fuel tank has been hung down underneath here and there's probably another tank in there also for the water. 
And there's another one here under uh, hooked up to it. This is taken in Fort Worth, Texas back in 60. Now here's another shot that I'm hoping that you can see how you can use one of these. This is a brand new set of UPF3 freight service units. It's on under test. There's the, uh, the Santa Fe heater car. It's under test on train for the trans, uh, Transcon. And uh, there are phase two units. And apparently, it was not as satisfactory as they wanted because I do not recall the UP building any steam boiler cars until they got up into the um, the, pa the passenger uh, executive trains. But this shows again, freight unit, steam gen, and a Either, I don't know what the Transcon was, but it looks like a lot of head end cars. Here's one that the Rio Grande made out of a tender. This one has got roller bearings, water and fuel fillers on the side. You've got an air intake and air exhaust, no doors other than excess doors on the side. So this had to be right behind the diesel unit to where uh, you did not have to walk through the car. Now this could be a very, very easy build to add operation to your layout. You could, you could buy a tender at a swap meet I wanted to be a little more particular when I built mine and, and had to scratch build mine. But this is a very easy conversion and can add a lot of operation. Here's one now in Chicago. I was able to snap this shot just before I got thrown out of this lumber yard. Literally, they came down and got me and escorted me out. Uh, an old Milwaukee caboose over here, but this, there was a picture in a back issue of Trains Magazine, which shows this converted tender with a mic pulling the business car. Door on the front looks like a vestibule on this end, because I don't see a door. Air intake, air exhaust, a removable roof. Well, most, well, all of them had removable panels over the boilers so they could reach in there with an overhead crane and pull that boiler out. But this is just a short locomotive tender. The Milwaukee converted several of their S2484 tenders. They did as, as little work on this car as they possibly could. You've got a fuel filter. They've got to have a petition in here. This has got to be the water tank. There is nothing under here, so there's no generator in here. And you can see the standard passenger uh, UC brake system. No doors on the end. There's a door on the opposite side. You've got a regular uh, Ajax brake wheel. you got a connector up here for passenger. You've got a backup light, a removable roof panel, exhaust, and air intakes. Very simple conversion for your layout. This is an all-welded tank but it doesn't have to be. If you're freelancing, this could be a, you know, a riveted car. Here's another one off an S2. This one has roller bearing trucks. They're fueling it. 
no doors. It's almost identical. This one has a light over the door. And they didn't raise the coal bunker or, or they removed the coal bunker sides on this one and build another higher uh, area. Air intake, exhaust, safety li line around it, standard boxcar ladders. This would take Ron maybe two evenings and he'd have it built. And here is that car in service. I don't know if you recognize this. This is the um, peanut elevator in Clinton. This is the Southwestern Limited northbound from Savannah to Milwaukee. It's 20, what was it, 25 or 28 below zero at the time this picture was taken. And snow on the ground could very well have been around Christmas time. So they had a train long enough that 1E7 could not maintain the steam. And so they hooked in the boiler car. It's a lot cheaper than buying another E unit. And they could have, they could have hooked in a, a freight unit into this system. So it's a fun car to, to mess with on your layout. And here's a shot up in the Northeast uh, with a little Joe with the uh, steam generator car. This is a freight unit. And there's that one of the cars. And as I recall, uh, the train was pulled, the, the Olympian was pulled backwards. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, from uh, Portland to Seattle. And uh, it's cold <laughs> enough they had to have steam heat. And another thing to consider in the summertime, there was a lot of heavy, uh, heavyweight equipment that had steam operated air conditioning systems. And so you don't need snow on the ground or even winter time to justify a steam generator car. Here's one now on, <clears throat> on the uh, Northern Pacific, another converted tender. This one has doors on both ends so that you can walk between F units and the passenger cars uh, behind it. It's a converted coal tender, diesel portholes, access on both sides. This one's a little different. So it's a riveted tender, a little easier to build, or if you didn't want it, you could certainly sand those rivets off. And here's the same car now being used on the tourist train on the Algoma Central. So you have three Jeep 38 freight units and the steam generator car. It doesn't look cold enough to me that it, whether they needed steam. So these could very, a lot of these cars could very well have uh, steam air conditioning equipment that needed to be used. And there's a shot of it after having run around the train. It's coming back down. You can see the, the same three porthole windows. You got two boilers in this one. There's two air intakes. This car ran all the time that they ran that train, which was what, into the 80s before they abandoned running it up the canyon. Another view, a little bit different view of it. You can see the, uh, the two air intakes and exhausts up 
the fuel uh, filter on the side. This was strictly a boiler car. It's on roller bearings, though. Here's another interesting one made out of a tender. Those of you that have been at the museum in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, this is where I took that picture, uh, is ex New York Central. They had quite a number. This particular uh, car had two boilers, one at each end, strictly a boiler car. The water and fuel tanks were on the inside of the car. There's no there's no filler along this. And this is not a door. It's just water runoff. The access door is back here on each side. There's a top view I took that shows the two boilers. The old and weary converted a steam ten, uh, tender. And the unique thing about this one, I suppose, is that they raised the height up to match the roof line of their F units. None of their F units had boilers. So there's another interesting twitch for uh, freelancing. Now we've looked at a lot of these. And I keep mentioning the different ways that these cars can be used. This is on the seaboard. It's on a hot Z train. You've got probably the superintendent of the division back here. They may be monitoring this train and what is ahead of it, but a box car that's been converted into a boiler car. This car has not been electrified and so needs steam for the air conditioning system. And it's got a pair of boilers. Here's two air intakes up here on the top. These are just ventilating. And there are no outlets along here. So it's strictly a heater car. If you want to run your business car, you can put it on a freight train if you want. But you want to put a steam boiler in there with it. Milwaukee converted several of their express baggage cars as the passenger service continued to fall off. Some of these became excess. This has got a pair of boilers in it. This is taken in the Northeast, I'm a Northwest. And you can see one of the Vapor Clarks and boilers in it. And uh, a very, very easy conversion. Uh, I don't see any fillers along the side of the car. So fuel and water, I'm going to guess, is underneath the car, but I don't see any filler here. Could have been up on the roof. But an easy conversion. Canadian National now built several of these for going through their mountainous areas. These were built new, brand new. And Rapidio has brought this car out. And you can see it's got double boilers. You've got two hatches up here, air intakes. You have nothing along the edge. So it is strictly a boiler car. The thing that I found interesting here is look how high up this step is. Mm -hmm. That tells me that this was used behind a freight unit, which had the raised, uh, you know, walkways. Back up light, connectors up there for passenger cars. New York Central converted some tenders that were probably used behind a mic, H1 or H5 mics. That's a heavy duty tender under frame. They just build a shell over it. It's got a steam boiler on it. This one was taken at Mott Haven where they were 
used in transferring passenger trains from diesel and steam on to electric to go on down into Grand Central Station. This is another one that's not near as nice, hooked up to a freight unit or a passenger maybe uh, that does not have a boiler. This was a heater car, 24. So they, I don't know if they had 24 of these or not, but this looks to be part of a tender. And this is all scratch built, air intake, air exhaust. Here's another easy conversion for you to have on your layout. If you'd want to go to the trouble of doing all that work on a locomotive tender, use a B unit. This is heater car 53 on the Southern. And I wanted a larger picture of it, but they had just brought this train into Atlanta and had uncoupled two freight RS3s that were pulling this train. And you got your air intake and exhaust up on the top, nothing on the sides. They're using a regular fuel tank. Very interesting conversion. Now here's an oddball. When the Rio Grande finally retired their PAs, they kept a B unit and they didn't want to maintain the old Alco truck. So they took it off the trucks and put a pair of Bloomberg free, uh, trucks <laughs> underneath this. So it really looks kind of bad from an aesthetic standpoint, but they're fueling it. And this was used on the ski train and any other special trains. Here it is behind two uh, Jeep 40s. And then we can get into other variations that were cheap and dirty, so to speak. Uh, this is at Paducah, Illinois Central converted a couple of B units and A units for Amtrak, putting a pair of steam boilers in them and using the regular fuel tanks and so forth. This is painted in Amtrak colors. And this one is an A unit. You can see the sloping part of the cab and part of the uh, sloping nose down on this one. <laughs> and those are boiler cars. And this is the B unit, which is at uh, Illinois Railway Museum. Great Northern used several of them. I took this picture in Duluth off the Viaduct. And I do not know uh, the history of this unit. I don't know if that's an F3 or an F7. It's not an FT. But there's a pair of boilers in here. There's a twin air intakes and twin exhausts. And of course, they would use this just like the Northern Pacific when they were going uh, up through the Rockies and uh, Montana and so forth. And they needed extra steam power. They had enough horsepower. They just didn't have enough steam. So you'll notice all five of these units have got steam boilers in them. And here's the same boiler car that it that went to Amtrak after the other passenger trains were dropped in 71. And they maintain the fuel tank. They have a water connection here. So one of these ends or both ends has got water tanks. They had to equalize the weight, air intakes, double the exhaust. Another easy conversion, which um, would be very easy. I, I keep using the word easy. Uh, I don't mean it uh, flippantly. But <clears throat> this is a converted troop car, of course. And uh, it's on uh, A3 ride trucks. Has two boilers on the CNO 
Walther sells these cars. This could be nicely converted into a steam generator car. Here's one on the New York Central where the troop, this is a troop sleeper because of the low windows. These have all been blanked out. They put a, a box car door on it. It's got two vapor clarks and boilers on the inside. There's a pair of uh, exhaust and air intakes. And in looking at these hoses down here in the bottom part, it looks like it's hooked up to this building. So apparently this customer needed steam. This is the XM and St. L, Doug, that the Northwestern acquired on merger. I do not have any pictures of this car in service on either the M and St. L or the Northwestern. It's still on Allied full cushion trucks, which is a nice touch, but it has two boilers in it. Do you recall if this was used behind the gas electric in the Bud passenger car? Did we lose Doug? This is the Monon car, again, another troop car. It's got all kinds of paraphernalia up on here that I cannot describe to you, except there are two boilers in here. And the fuel and water tanks appear to be underneath. Uh, again, a cool thing here is, is a chance for you to use Allied full cushion trucks. Here's a picture I got from our friends, Mott Switzer, which shows air intake and exhaust. And one of the unusual things here is a fan off an EMD diesel. And I guess that's to keep the inside of that car cool. But there's an air intake for a boiler. And here's another air intake for a boiler. This one is on a fan trip. This is Georgetown. It's on the B&O. You can see the exhaust and so forth up here on the roof. Another converted troop car, which is easy to do. This one is not so easy and wouldn't fit a model railroad very well because this is a 70 footer, but it is loaded. You can see exhaust here from an engine generator, another one which could be an auxiliary generator, and you can see all the fittings down along the sides here for air and electrical lines. It's a very multi-purpose car. It's got a pair of steam generators in it, but this would be a little hard to manipulate around on your layout. Same thing with this. This is a picture I took in Fort Worth. You've all heard of Texas. This is uh, a pair of generators that's been put into a coach. Air intakes, exhaust, hatches that come off of the boilers. Again, a 70 footer. But I'm just showing this to show you how the versatility. I like this one. This appears to be, and it's the only picture I have found, a 36 foot, not 40, single baggage car heavyweight. Here's a clear story roof. And I do not know where this came from. I don't know if it was a 60 footer they cut up, whether it was purchased new this way or what, but it's on the California Zephyr. And these two units that's pulling it apparently is not going to have the steam capacity it needs. And of course, this one is on the UP business train. And uh, there's two boilers up in the roof of this one. And the fuel tank has been added underneath. The water tank is down under there. 
which unbalance the car. So this end has a four wheel truck. This end has a six wheel truck for the support the weight. Now here's two Santa Fe boiler cars. Anybody want to guess what they're doing? This is in New Mexico. They're using steam to blow the sand out of the ballast. And they got a water tank. So this could run for quite a distance. Interesting. Here's one on the back of an Amtrak train. I don't see any steam coming out of the barco connectors down here underneath. So it could be a dead end tow. But it's got, uh, it's one of the two that you previously saw with the air intake and exhaust. Now we're gonna go to the Northwestern car. The Northwestern had 35 of these beautiful locomotives with huge tenders. 20 tons of coal, 18,000 gallons of water in a water bottom tender, which we will look at. These 484s, according to the PFM 484 book, were the highest tractive 484s built. And with the booster, they had 84,000 pounds of tractive effort. When the 5017 was scrapped, they rolled the tender into the 40th Street shops and built this steam generator car, which we've already talked about a little bit. But notice the striping, there's black stripe between the yellow and black and this one here, and that matches the 400 cars. Another shot showing some of the paraphernalia on the roof, friction bearing trucks. And on the other side is that 25 kW generator set. I ran into this picture or took these in 1964 at the 40th Street shops in Chicago. And you can see, we, we talk about color schemes and heralds and stuff on freight equipment. Notice the changes now that's beginning to come onto this car. It's no longer steam generator car 150, it's steam generator X262400. So they're, they're They've made a change. Another side view, noticing all the detail on the end. There's mark uh, class lights on both ends. The hookup for passenger equipment, a backup light. It's a pretty fancy car. Rear view. Top view showing the air reservoirs. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to get up here and get these and not uh, get asked to leave. Walk way off the top of a box car, vents, exhaust, intake, and the two fueler, fuel uh, caps for those two uh, fuel tanks. Uh, that were uh, in the end of the car, the UC brake equipment behind the two reservoirs. Front view showing lots of detail. And this, of course, would be the cab end in which this was all built up out of steel. Now we're at 69, five years later, the black stripe is gone. This has been enlarged, steam generators have been moved to the rear. The black separation stripes are gone. Still on friction bearing trucks, still at 40th Street. Diagram. Now I mentioned water bottom. Water bottom tenders carried a considerable amount of water. These are general or Commonwealth one piece 
water bottom tender under frames. And you'll notice in the bottom view here, this is all hollow under here. Instead of a tender with just the uh, center sills down the center, like you see on a steam locomotive, this was all cast, this one big casting. And this had held a considerable amount of water. This one was off, that was a 484. This is off the Hudson and the Hudson tender. Well, I couldn't find the tender I wanted at all. I just could not do it. And the theory on my layout is if I can, I can take a Katy car, which is virtually perfect, out of the box and use it. If I need something different, I'll kit bash it if I can. If I can't kit bash it, then I scratch build. And this car is totally scratch build. And this is the drawing that I did. I simulated the, the corrugated water bottom on it. I divided it into the water, uh, the tank top, the tank bottom, and the underframe. And then, of course, had the cross pieces and the uh, pieces to support the uh, sheet metal roof. Now, I'm only showing you some of this because I want you to. to pick up some techniques, not build this car, but to look at some things that I did. I made a sanding fixture to be sure everything would be square 90 degrees in the same length. This is just a, a piece of plywood with a one by, I believe it was about an inch and a half, um, fine grit, heavier grit, and I'm getting a perfect 90 degree edge. And I can use a pair of calipers on here and get the exact width that I need. If I'm trying to sand a piece that's a little shorter, I put in a little shorter piece of wood. This gets filled a little bit, I take it outside, and hit it with a toothbrush, clean it out. Here are the top, the bottom, and the underframe, which I screwed together to get the 90 degree edge that I needed and to get the exact same width. And then I started to put it together. So you got the top, you got the bottom, you got the cross supports and the roof ribs. This is a wraparound that I drew uh, out of uh, styrene with the inset doors, the inset uh, area for the fuel and the water, air intakes, the outside view of it. And everything is laid out on here so that once this goes together, I know where all the hand, you know, I've even got the, the uh, grab irons ready to, to go in. I don't have to do any, you can see all the measurement lines back here. They're all in place for the detail parts. Uh, I didn't quite get the height of this right. And I had to fill that with green squadron putty. And then the back part here is a secondary piece front view, 25 kW generator. There's several pieces of 60,000 styrene there to get the box I wanted. The water tank lid, these are all little pieces of styrene. The accumulator tanks and the UC passenger brake cylinders. These are just Chemtron brass fittings soldered up. <clears throat> Parts are now going on the car. And if you'll recall, this looks just like the photographs that you previously have seen. These are the three pieces screwed together. And now that we have the, the top of the tank done, I'm gonna to start to work now on the water bottom. And here are the 
little corrugation pieces out of 10 thousandths that I put in to make it look like the uh, cor the cast corrugations that you saw in, in the other pictures. This being the rear of the tender, this being the front where the water hoses were attached to go uh, to the boiler. This clears the center part of the casting of the truck. And then of course you got a ton of detail. Everything here you see in brass is scratch built. These of course are DA or Cal scale parts. Conduit out of the box it went up to the inside. The trucks look, this is a set of trucks from Hallmark, but they didn't have the back brake shoe on them. And it looked real bare and kind of weird in a way. So I scratch built the hangers and screwed them on in the back. And then I took a, one of the brass shoes off, made a mold and cast the shoes for the outside brake hangers. And then I got the passenger car diagram to find out the dimensions of where these black stripes would go. And there's the painted car and you can see the difference. Um, it makes to have these outside brake shoes on. This took uh, first place at an NMRA convention. Now I got a few minutes. I want to show you something else that makes an interesting thing for your operation. Here is another class H tender. This one with the top totally cut off. This is Western Avenue in South St. Paul. And it is a five or six track yard down there. And this is a sand and diesel fuel car. And it's operated off of the air hose on the front of the locomotive. The fuel pump and this pump that blows the sand into the sand hoppers is operated by engine air. Nice little touch for a tiny yard. You don't need the, the, the high standing pipes. You don't need a big fuel tank on the side or a pump house. You just have this car sitting over on the edge in the weeds. It's another shot of it. Very simple thing to chop up. Here's the top view showing the filler caps for the sand and the diesel fuel. This is the fuel pump and it's hooked up to this Jeep. They're fueling this Jeep. You can see it's a fairly good size yard. So there were several engines that ran out of here, switchers and Jeeps. Another thing that the Northwestern did, they converted several of these big tanks into snow plows. This would make an interesting addition to your layout. Center uh, wheel and at least the back truck, I couldn't see under here, uh, has been removed and it's full of gravel. They made several of these. There's a brand new one being painted. 19 Clinton, 264. Here's one at Mo Valley that the snow was pushed all on one, all to one side. These were all replaced with X Rock Island loaf of bread tank cars, of which were then replaced with the UP's fancy snow plows. So I think my hour is up. Have I excited you into making a steam generator car? 
for passenger industrial use. Look good, Floyd. Floyd looks really good. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Great job, Lloyd. Wonderful Thanks. presentation. And Ron, Ron sent me a picture of that um, Algoma Central, and that's why I turned you off, Ron. I was at, this was being prepared, and I didn't want to get a big <laughs> conversation going on steam boiler cars when I thought I was going to cover it here. <laughs> Lloyd, were any of those cars used for um, passenger equipment that used steam air conditioning? Yes. Okay. Yes, I mentioned that. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed yeah, it. Like the Algoma Central picture, that was not a winter picture. And the Santa Fe had a lot of steam uh, equipped air conditioned car. Well, a lot of railroads did. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that system worked, so I can't describe it to you, but it was run from steam. Did you ever stand in the exhaust of uh, a steam locomotive that had the drains open on the front cylinders? Oh, yeah. You know how cold it is? Yeah. That's how it, how it works. Okay, it's expansion. Exactly. Compression makes heat, expansion makes cold. All right. Well, wonderful job, Lloyd. Uh, we, we appreciate it and uh, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. We are going to stay on Tuesdays next week and actually for the foreseeable future. And next week we have uh, Clark lined up to talk about some reconfiguration of staging he's doing on the Story City branch. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, there may be extra time next week if anybody else wants to do a short subject that would be fine um have a good evening i think we're done thanks greg all See right you. yep thank you thank you, thank bye -bye. you. Thanks, Lloyd. Bye. take care guys all right bye-bye